Good morning. Happy Sunday. If you will stand and worship with us this morning.
Good morning, Bedford Acres. Um, Good morning. <laughs> this is, uh, if you're a first time guest, we are glad you're here. Stop by our Welcome Center where you can find out more information about the church. And we have first time visitor guest bags. Connect cards, if you guys will take out your connect card that's behind your seat and fill that out, we would like to see who's here. Okay, we've got lots of announcements, so here they come. Our missions team is coordinating a food drive to benefit the Bourbon County Paris School Resource Centers. We are collecting 16 ounce peanut butter jars, so if you could bring those in soon, we wanna get that to the, the school. Operation Food Basket is here this week. If you could volunteer for that, make sure you sign up in the foyer. There's a table out there that you can sign up. American Heritage Girls and Trail Life Boys are encouraged to invite to experience the troops meeting and events. Touch base with Aaron if you have any questions. All right, here comes Easter. Easter is three weeks away. BACC's Easter weekend services are opportunities to invite your friends and family to hear and experience God's good news. In addition to the Easter Sunday service, we also have family event on Good Friday. We're going to be making uh, lanterns and having a lighting ceremony after that. Dan Giese is leading a Sunday morning class to help you invite friends and family to our Easter service. They were going in the Mac room. And the last but not least, we have yard signs out there in the foyer if you want to take home. So put it in your yard so everyone will know that Easter's going to be here. And I just want to pray. <laughs> thank you, Father, for this day. And thank you for being so wonderful. And, and you're, the, you're the good, good God, Father. And everything that we say or do, I want to be... Uh, that didn't sound right. <laughs> well, just thank you, Lord. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Stand up and welcome each other. Say hello. Good morning. Do whatever you want to 
Good morning, church. It's my honor and privilege to be able to uh, give this uh, meditation on our communion. And uh, communion is the key. I would really like to participate together with you. So if you would, let's prepare our, our uh, wafer and cup together. And we'll do this together because I, as I was working on this communion meditation, I couldn't help but think that this is all about community. Yes, indeed, it is deeply personal. Yes, indeed, it is between you and the Lord, but it is between us and the Lord. We are, we are celebrating what the Lord started out with, and as it was put together in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the, the communion, as Jesus first did it in his last time with the disciples before he was betrayed, before he was arrested, um, he gave his body, he gave his cup for us cup is a covenant with us but in John the gospel of John there are several prayers that are recorded and the last prayer that last prayer that was recorded in public before he was betrayed I want to read to you so bear with me Jesus said I pray for those who will believe in me through their through the disciples' word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be even as we are, one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. So that's why I want to be together with you. See, we share in a special event. Not unlike you can think of many milestones that you may have shared with others. Maybe it was a game, a win or a loss. Sorry, Cats fans. Uh, but, but you may have been with a friend when 9-11 occurred. And that bond is, between you and that friend is so much closer because of that event. What event do we share? We share our rebirth. We share knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. We share in the event, in the experience, the greatest in all of humanity's history. The greatest, right? We share something extra special. We share in his love for us that gift that's undeserved. We share in the joy knowing that he conquered death. And that is shared by us so that we have conquered sin. And we share the joy in knowing that we are part of his purpose together in unity. So share with me now as we take this gift of his body broken for us. As we take this juice, his blood flowing for us to wash us clean and to usher in a new covenant with him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this body of believers. Lord, I thank you for the work that you've done, I thank you for the gift that you've given us. And Lord, I thank you for the purpose that you've built us for. May we, in unity and in love for one another, do all to glorify you so that the world may know 
that you are alive, that you are the perfect gift, the perfect manna, bread of life from heaven, and the perfect covenant through your blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as the ushers uh, get together and come down here, I would like to pray for our offering this morning. And I thank you very much for that. Let's bow our heads and pray for all that God has given us. Lord, indeed, everything, as we have just sung, everything comes from you and everything is to you. So, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be stewards of all of the gifts that you've given us. And, Lord, I pray that we are able to uh, be a good steward and share this back to you and to your kingdom so that you may be glorified in all things. And I thank you for these gifts in advance, that they do the work that you want us to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I've asked the praise team to help me for just a second. So you guys just line up over here, like from here, like that way, okay? Now, here's a question first for them, because most of them don't even know what this is. How many of you have ever played Red Rover? Okay, some, some of you haven't. You didn't know it, okay? All right, how many of you all have played Red Rover? Younger people have actually played it. I didn't know some. I, I need about five volunteers. Come on, you. 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 I need some beefer, beefier ones. Come on. Come on, Sticks. Somebody pointed you out. Bring Larry with you because she pointed, you know. Come on, Larry. Come on. Come on down here. Now, y'all remember the game Red Rover, right? Such a wonderful game, right? If you want to break somebody's arm, you want to pull somebody's arm out of socket, uh, it was always great, you know, if you could get, to, you know, to clothesline somebody, right? That's a, it's a great game, okay? So what we're going to do is you guys, are, you guys are one team right here, okay? Line up this way, okay? You guys, uh, come on over here. You, we'll push you, over here. you go there too. We've got two teams here. Okay, we're not going to actually hurt anybody, I hope. Okay, so you remember the game? What do you got to do? Oh, 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 okay, oh, I saw somebody, a real player here, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, so, so the deal of this game, if you don't remember it, is you have one team and another team, and this team, for example, has a captain. Who wants to be the captain? Okay, you be the captain. Who's the captain on your team? John is, okay. Which, which John? There's two of them. Big John. Big John, little John, Okay. Okay, so the, the deal is, is this captain here will call somebody from this team. What happens if they call somebody and they can't break through the line? What happens? Yeah, yeah. If you keep them going, they join your team, okay? What if they break through the line? They get to take somebody back, right? Okay, so here's the deal, John. You get to pick somebody from that team. <coughs> he says Carla, okay? Now, this is, this is part of the game. John, little John. Why would you pick Carla over everybody else? I think I can take her. <laughs> the love of Jesus is in my son. He said, if you didn't hear, he said, because I think I can take her. Okay. Now, there's a strategy here. Okay. There's a strategy. Okay. Carla, Carla, we're, we're going to pretend that you run over here. Now, where are you going to go? Which, which, where's the hole that you want to go through? Because you want to break through. Which one? That's right. Yes, she does. So who, who are you going to pick? Okay, walk over there. Because how many think that she could make break that through? Ain't no way. Okay. So we're going to pretend you come over here. You did not break through. So what happens to Carla now? She's now stuck over here. Now, okay, here's the problem with this game. Okay, if you pick someone you think can't break through because... They're not maybe the strongest or the youngest or whatever. Then you've got a weak spot, okay? So now it's your turn to pick somebody. Who are you going to pick? John, okay? Buckle up there. Now, John, now John's aggressive. I don't know where he gets that. I think he gets it from his mother. Uh, where, if you want to break through, where are you going to go? Right there. Oh, why there? He knows he can take me. Man, this... You see what you're marrying here, don't you? I, be oh, I believe she can take all of them. <laughs> She's like, okay, John, you think you can break that? Miriam says no. How many think he can break through between Miriam? How many think not? Uh, all right. We're going to assume you didn't, okay, just, just for the game's sake. So, so you go over there. You don't, so what happens now? You didn't break through. You're stuck over there, okay? So this is how this game goes. The problem is... If you get enough weaker people that, that you can contain them, then you wind up with a weaker line. If you get strong people, then, you know, you're not going to get. Now, how do you win this game? Everybody remember? Once everybody is taken from one side to the other, the strong side wins, okay? So that's, that's what this game is. Thank you, guys. Just give them a hand for the demonstration. All right, good job, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's so funny, I, I went to Kristen uh, before church and said, hey, I need you to get the praise team up here to hang around. And, and I said, have you ever played Red Rover? She said, no, I've never heard of it. But that's what happens when you're raised in a different country, maybe, but uh, all that. But uh, 
I thought, I was surprised because there's a lot of younger people. That have, how many of you have never played this game? Anybody? Yeah. Most younger people have not played this game, okay? Now, are there other games you can think of that some, someone of, uh, of my tender age uh, might have played that they don't play anymore? Duck, duck, goose, okay. Yeah, you'll still see that a little bit, but, but it was never dangerous. What? Hide and seek, okay. Yeah, that's a game a lot of people don't play. I mean, a lot of games we don't play because of this right here, right? How about jarts? Anybody remember jarts? Yeah, that's a wonderful game to kill your kid, okay. Here's another one you can't play anymore. Cowboys and Indians, okay. Cops and robbers, they don't even play that, right? Uh, kick the can, stick ball. Okay, uh, when, you're, when you're of a tender age like me, you remember those things, but you young kids, you know, 50 and under, pretty much, you, you just haven't lived. How many of you ever uh, had real monkey bars? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember monkey bars. Monkey bars would kill you. We had this one, and I was in elementary school, and it was one of those, you, you went up, you climbed it, and then you cross, and it's probably about eight feet off the ground, you know? And did you ever do like I did and dive off the top to grab one of them and miss? Yes, a belly whopper on, on grass. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. A back flop is even worse. <laughs> I mean, literally, I dove for it and did a flip, bang, right on my back. <gasps> I didn't die, though, okay? So what we're talking about, you say, why in the world are you talking about all this nonsense in church? Well, we're starting a new series today, and we're calling it Child's Play. And the next couple of weeks, as we lead up to Easter, we're going to talk about three different games that we played as kids and some comparisons with the story of Jesus, even. Okay? This morning, as we unwrap it, you're going to see as we talk about Red Rover. Next week, we're going to talk about Tag. And the last one makes a lot of sense is hide and seek. You know, how people at the, at the resurrection of Jesus, at the death of Jesus, you have, you have this big spiritual game of hide and seek going on. And I think we still do. So we're going to talk about it as we go. But bottom line, when I was a kid, Red Rover was not one of my favorite games. Uh, part of it was because I was a late bloomer. Uh, I played football in high school as a freshman for Covington Homes. Uh, I was five foot tall as a freshman. <laughs> I mean, until I was like, I got my driver's license at 16 when I was a sophomore, and my first driver's license said I was five foot five. So can you imagine if you're playing Red Rover, and I'm one of the little kids, and I was as short as most of the girls, and definitely shorter than the boys, and I was a little bit on the chunky side. I was a target. I mean, I, you know, you get in that line, and I knew good and well that when they were looking for someone to break the line of, it was going to be somebody yelling, Red Rover, Red Rover, let Dean come over, okay? And then I couldn't break the line, and then I'm the weak point, so when my team starts calling somebody, guess who they're aiming at? They're aiming at the little short fat kid, okay? Yeah, childhood is brutal, <laughs> and it was definitely brutal in that. Now, fortunately, I did get a little taller, I did get a little stronger, and I outgrew Red Rover, <laughs> okay? I don't have to play that anymore. Uh, but just because I've got taller, just because I've got stronger, and all of you have done the same thing. You're all stronger physically. You're probably stronger emotionally. You're probably stronger spiritually. You're probably stronger intellectually than maybe you were when you was a kid. But here's the thing. You still have those weak points, don't you? Any line that they put you in, there's going to be an area of weakness that you still have. Now, you might try to hide it. You might try to deny it. But the truth is, we all have our weaknesses. And so this morning... We're going to talk about what do you do with those weaknesses. And to see that, I want us to see the scene uh, in Matthew chapter 26, what's going on at that time. Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Last Supper's already happened. They've already gone up into the garden. Jesus is there. He's got his 11 of his 12 because Judas has already gone to betray him. Uh, it, it's going to happen in just a matter of minutes, really, from this point. And so they're in the garden, and Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, I'm going to go pray. He takes Peter, James, and John with him, and he's asking them to pray with him. And we're going to pick up that text. That's what's happening in this story. In verse 36 of Matthew 26, it says that Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, he's talking to the 11, he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that'd be James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not my, not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for even one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, if you will, let's see this as a spiritual version of Red Rover. On the one hand, you've got the disciples. On the other hand, you've got Satan. And Satan is about to try to crash the line, okay? And, and so Jesus is talking to them, and, you know, the disciples want to win this game. They're competitive. They want to win. You want to win. You don't want to be losing the game spiritually. And yet, if you're honest, you know there are areas where you're going to be weak, and, you, and you're going to struggle. And so that's what we see here. Satan is about to come charging at their line, and he's going to look for the weakest link in that chain. Now, where is this in Jesus' ministry? I mean, think about this. You know, by this point, he's experienced life as a human for about 33 years. He understands fully the weaknesses that we can all have in the flesh. And he's also very aware of how well Satan can play this game. And he's telling his followers they need to do two things here. You need to watch and you need to be praying. It's critical for us. It's critical for you and for me to be ready when temptation comes. Make no mistake. Temptation is coming. It absolutely is coming. You will not be exempt from it. So a couple things I want to see. Jesus knew that since temptation was coming, that for these disciples, so what's he tell them? He tells them to watch out. He says, watch and pray. The first thing we see is watch out. Now, if uh, he knew that they were about to hit some rough waters, and he tells them to be ready and be aware. If, I, if I'm with you somewhere and I say, watch out, you know, you don't even know what it is, but what you instinctively do. You start looking around. What's going on? Uh, there's your, you husbands, I'll ask you. You're driving down the road, and, and your wife goes, watch out. What do you do? Oh, what, what the heck? A cow. No. You know, and my wife, she's, she's a little more emphatic on some things than I am. It scares me to death. Watch out! What? What? I hit a kid. No. You hit a leaf. But, but the bottom line is, you know good and well, if I yell, watch out! You know there's something about to happen, and it's generally not watch out, it's a sale. Okay? Watch out, there's a great deal. No, it's usually something that you, you really want to make sure you see, because it's really not something you do want to see, right? Especially, you get surprised by it. And, and so, when Jesus says, watch and pray, it's not just, hey, you know, look, beautiful sunrise. It's not, oh, look at that moon. No, he's saying, watch out. Something's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen potentially. And, and so we, we need to really see that. Now, he's warning them that they are about to be a target. He's warning them that, hey, in this game of spiritual Red Rover, your name's about to be called. Or you're going to call and somebody's going to come over and they're going to try to crash into that weak spot in your life. And he says, watch out. And it's interesting, First Peter, I'm sure Peter remembers this, because in, in First Peter he writes about it somewhat. And as he says in 5.8, he said, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So what are the weak links in our chain? What's the weak link in your chain? Uh, not everyone is going to have the same weakness. But everybody's going to have some weakness. You probably know what it is. I don't need to know what it is for you. I just need to be aware of what mine are. And we all need to be aware of them. But that doesn't mean, this is, I think this is important too. It doesn't mean because you know you have a weak point that you have to live in fear. Doesn't mean you have to be terrified all the time because you've got this weakness. Uh, in 1 Timothy, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, God did not give us. A spirit that makes us afraid, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. He doesn't say he gives you a spirit of super strength. Doesn't say that it's a spirit where you're not tempted. It just says he gives you the power, you know, to when someone says, hey, watch out, you, you can kind of be prepared for it. You don't have to be afraid. Jesus wasn't telling them or us to be afraid, 
But he's telling us, hey, keep your wits about you. He said, pay attention. Kind of, kind of see what's coming. Jesus knew temptation would be coming and that they would need to watch out. And he knows the same for you and for me. The second thing Jesus told them to do was to pray. He says, watch and pray. Not just watch, but, you know, you can be, you know, active in the prayer too. And don't miss the significance. This is huge. Jesus is just about to take on the sin of every man, woman, and child that's ever lived or ever would live. He's about to endure one of the most, if not the most horrible thing any man could ever endure. He's on the verge of facing God's, the fullness of God's fury and anger head on. All that. And what does he tell his men to be praying for? I mean, he says, I want you to pray for me, yeah, and they go to sleep, and then he wakes them up and says, hey, couldn't you just pay attention for an hour? Couldn't you stay with me? And he says, watch and pray. Why? Because the tempter is coming to you. With all this going on, Jesus is telling his men not to pray. He didn't say don't pray for him, but he's specifically saying, I want you to pray for yourselves. Don't miss that. In the darkest hour of Jesus' life here, he's still telling his followers, pray for yourselves. So God is telling you, he's telling me, hey, when you're going through these tough times, when the Red Rover game starts and it's always on in your life, pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. Are we doing that? Are we really doing that? Because he knows that they're going to face the temptations. Now, and he says, wake up, guys. It's about to get real. It's about to get real bad is what it's going to get. And you don't want to be the weakest link. And he knew it was coming. So you and I need to be careful that we don't let our lack of prayer be the weak link in our life. And you might be thinking, well, Dean, I need to be honest. I stink at prayer. I mean, I am just not, I'm not any good at this. And, and maybe that begs the question, you know, we need to ask, and, and I don't want to assume everybody knows everything. I, I need this challenge myself. When I say prayer, what is prayer? What is prayer? And I think some people think prayer is, you know, you got to learn all these, you know, crazy words. You know, it's not. Prayer is simply a conversation with God. I mean, have you seen this? Maybe you've seen some preacher did this, and I hope I'm not one of those preachers. You know, if you talk to them like out in the foyer, and they just talk like normal people. You run into a Walmart, they're just, just regular old people. And then they get up in church, and they start praying. And it's like, oh, thou almighty God who blesses us, us, all of us. We want to talk to thee, 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 and about he, 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 and all that. It's like you have to have a special language to pray. And I didn't go to Bible college. I don't know that language. Okay, Hogwash. <laughs> you don't need that. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to spit out a theological dictionary in front of him. He just wants to talk to you. And it's crazy. When you, when you see Jesus, how did Jesus refer to God? What did he call God? Father. Dad. Matter of fact, it's really interesting. In Aramaic, which was what a lot of the folks spoke back then, the term Abba. Remember the term Abba? And I'm not talking about the Swedish rock group from the 70s and 80s. Okay? Abba. You know what Abba meant literally? Even more intimate than that. Daddy, I mean, what would you think if your kid comes across the room and says, oh, Father? <laughs> I mean, John has done that a time or two, being a smart aleck. He can be a smart aleck, I'll, I'll be honest. But you know, what, 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 what term do I like best as, as a dad, John? Yeah, <laughs> it's because I can't hear it. I, I go, Dad, Dad, Dean! <laughs> I listen to that. No, oh, man, I love it. I love it, love it, love it. When my kids come and say, hey, Dad, Dad. When Jesus prays, Abba, he's not saying, oh, thou great and mighty Father. He's saying, Dad. And that, that's what prayer needs to be for us. It needs to be a conversation with our dad. And little kids, it would not just be Dad, it would be Daddy. Remember the first time? I, you know, <laughs> how many of you, your kid's first word was Dad. Or daddy. I guarantee every dad in here remember that. <laughs> did, did you wear your wife out over that? Yeah, me, I'm the favorite. <laughs> Why do they say dad before they say mom? Because it's easier. Because <laughs> it's easier phonetically, that's all. 
Okay, sorry, Dad. It's not because they love you more. <laughs> but yeah, that's, when we talk to God, he wants us to talk to us like a dad. Now, that doesn't mean you don't show respect. It doesn't mean he's not a heavenly father. It doesn't mean that you, you, know, you don't recognize him as holy and mighty and all that because he is. And, and I don't think we should be so cavalier about it. It says, hey, old man, it's you. How's it hanging up, everybody? I, I don't think that would be appropriate. Okay. Hey, dude, how's it going, bro? What's up? No, I don't think we need to be praying like that. But it's okay for us to talk to him as dad. He wants us to. Jesus wants us to do that. In Psalm 46.10, it also says, Be still and know that I am God. Someone called me this week, and I, and I really do appreciate this, and they're going to know who they are, and I'm not going to tell you who they are. And they saw the notes, and they said, I'm not sure you should use the word shut up in the notes. Because if you look at the notes, it basically says the conversation needs to be two ways, and, and part of it is sometimes I just need to shut up. Now, I didn't say God says shut up. But then I wrestled with that question, and it really was a good question, and I thank that person for it. Do you think God sometimes might want to tell us to shut up? Now, I don't know if he, now in our culture, you can't say stupid, but you can't call somebody stupid, right? You can use the Lord's name in vain by saying, oh my God, a thousand times. But if you say stupid, it's like a cuss word, right? Now, you can say something is stupid, but you can't say someone is stupid. Is that correct? Okay. And, and obviously, if you tell somebody they don't like what they're saying, shut up. That's rude, okay? And I don't know that, I think the point that my friend was making was that they don't see God as rude, and I agreed with that 100%. But think about your prayer life. Think about how much we listen to God. And, and think about sometimes that, for me, maybe not you, but I'm a little slow learner sometimes. I have to think sometimes God would really like to tell me, Dean, just shut up. <laughs> you know the word in Psalm, there's a word in Psalm that says Selah. If you see that in there, you see it 71 times in the Psalms. Only three other times in the whole Bible do you see that word, and they're all in the book of Habakkuk, okay? And they all mean the same thing. Here, you Jewish roots, what's Sela mean? Huh? You didn't learn that in Jewish school? <laughs> what it literally means is stop and listen. It's like a rest in music. You know, the musicians will see there's a rest, and it means you stop for just a second. Why do you stop? Why do you put a rest in music? For effect. It, it gives those notes before and after it a little punch. Okay? And so when Psalms, when it, when it says Selah, what God is saying is, I want you to be quiet and listen. Now, I think it's probably a gentler word than saying, shut up and listen. But the truth of it is, I think for me, I don't know that God is going to tell me to shut up and listen, but I think Dean needs to tell Dean to shut up and listen. Uh, uh, <laughs> you realize I'm the guy that, can you imagine what I got in trouble for in school? <laughs> I, I, was always, I was always a good student. I was a teacher's pet. I mean, I'm the guy, you know, little, I'm volunteering to clean the erasers. You know, I'm the guy that's picking up the pencils. I was never the hall monitor. I never wanted to be that. But I remember in the third grade, I just, I love this teacher. She was great, but she's one of these teachers, if you talk when you're not supposed to, you know, you get your name on the board. If you talk again, you get a hash mark. You, you t talk a third time, you get a, another hash mark. Guess what happens after you get that? Yeah, that was when they paddled kids in school. I got paddled every single week in the third grade. I did, I did. I know that's shocking to you all. But I turned it into a career. <laughs> I make a living talking. But I'm also one of these people, and if I've done this to you, I apologize, and I know I have. Have you ever been talking, and someone's talking back to you, and they're, they're in the middle of their, their, their spiel, and you want to help them out, and you start talking, and they say, let me finish? How many ever had someone tell you, let me finish? Okay, a couple of you. Okay, the rest of you are lying, okay? Uh, no, some of you are just really not that outgoing. You're not the mouthy type like me. But, you know, every time someone's done that, I feel like an idiot, because I realize I'm being rude. You ever watch the news? You know, somebody's interviewing somebody, especially the political interviews. I mean, they try to, they try to trick a candidate into saying something, and so they're, they're trying to answer, and they, they keep pushing, pushing. And how many times you heard that politician or somebody say, let me finish, let me finish. 
I think that may be what God wants to tell me sometimes when I'm praying. You know, because so many times I think we go to God and say, God, you know, my big toe hurts. My sister's got warts. Uh, you know, I'm broke. Uh, the country's in, in, the, in, you know, going to hell in a handbasket, blah, blah. We tell him all these things, and they're all true, and they're all needs. We have our sick list. We have our prayer list. We have all these lists, and we want to go to God and say, God, I need this, 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 and this. And then we say, amen. And I think that's the point where God may want to be coming in and in his way. And shut up. <laughs> Let me finish. And sometimes for me, if I'm honest, not only does he need to say, Let me finish, he might be saying, Dummy, let me start. <laughs> because prayer is a two way conversation. It's a two way. And so, yes, we talk to him, but we need to listen to him. And to listen to him, I have to be quiet. And I think sometimes we struggle with that. And he's telling his disciples, watch and pray. He didn't just say, hey, pray that I make it through this. He wants them to hear him as well. And we so need that. So here's a question. Even knowing, I mean, uh, well, the third thing I want you to see here. I mean, he says to watch and pray, pray and listen, okay? I, I mean, because God wants to help us make it through these challenges. I mean, you got challenges in life. How do you get through it? I, I was talking to Karen earlier. We've got a mutual friend. I, I really, really covet your prayers. One of the songs we sang, the last song we sang, actually, that last part of that song, that was the song we sang at North Bullet. And while we're singing that, I can see Mary Benami up there playing the piano. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can see, you know, pr, you know, Martin Brooks probably leading it. And I can see Don Carney playing his guitar. You don't know Don Carney. Don Carney is one of the most wonderful men. He loved the Lord. He loved his family. He's got cancer. He's not going to make it. Found out from his wife yesterday. They thought he might have a couple weeks. Hospice is involved. And he's really taking a turn. He may not make it through the weekend. You know? We've all got that. You all got loved ones, people that you've buried and people that are fighting for their life. And it's like, how do you get through that? You talk to God about it. And let him talk to you. And you listen. You got financial issues. You got health issues. Tell God about it. Yes, but listen to him. Relationship. <laughs> if you got relationship, you got relationship difficulties, don't you? The list goes on. Maybe right now you're going through some stuff and Jesus is softly telling you, watch and pray, listen. The lady in our church, that she's here today, I won't call her up or anything, but her grandson, he's had some health issues since the day he was born. Serious issues, very terrible developmental problems. And, he, and he's, he's in bad shape. I, I would encourage you, talk to God about it. I know you're talking to God about it. We are with you, but also listen to God. Listen to Dad. Listen to Dad. You know, I think I mentioned this last week. There's two different kind of things. You know, when you're young and you mess up and, and you're thinking, wow, I can't imagine having to tell Dad about this. You know what happens when you get a little older? You're going through some problems. And if you're like me, you know what you say? I'd give anything to talk to my dad about this. That, that's what God wants. God doesn't want to be the dad that you're afraid he'll find out what you did. He knows anyway. <laughs> he wants to be the dad that when the wheels are falling off, when the world's topsy-turvy, hey, dad, <laughs> we need talk. I need advice. I need a shoulder. I need a hug. <laughs> That's what Jesus is telling his followers here. At the darkest hour in his life, he's telling these men, hey, watch and pray. Talk to dad. And then listen to dad. And why? Why do that? I mean, you know it. I know it. We're train wrecks. 
I'm going to mess up. I'm always going to lose at this one point in Red Rover. There's always going to be the guy who's bigger. There's always going to be the guy who's faster or meaner. I'm going to lose. I know I'm going to lose. Why even waste my time praying? Jesus knew. He says, you all are going to be scattered. He knew they'd be scattered, and he still says pray about it. Why? Why not just wait till it's over and ask forgiveness? He didn't do that. Why? Because ultimately, he wanted them to be, and he wants me to be, and I want it to be the desire of my heart. Even though I know there's going to be times I fail, I still want that burning desire to not. I want that desire to get it right. I may fail a thousand times, but I still want to work on it because it's what he wants. I want to serve God. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father and grandfather. I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a faithful witness for Jesus. But you know what else I know? <laughs> this is one thing I know about all these things. There's a weak link, and it's me. I am the weakest link. The problem is Dean Scott. It is. I'd love to blame Melody. Adam tried that. Adam, did you eat that fruit? He said, yeah, the wife you gave me. Yeah, she made me do it. <laughs> I'd like to blame my kids. Man, if you had my kids, oh my gosh, you'd lose your mind too. I'd like to, I'll tell you what, you may not believe this, but church people can be difficult sometimes. There's a reason they call all of us sheep, because sheep stink, they bite, and yes, they can be uh, stupid sometimes. Yeah, I, my problem is not me, it's the sheep you've given me, Lord. Give me some smarter sheep, my job be easier. No, it's me. Oh, I know what the problem is. It's Joe Biden. That's the problem, it's, it's those daggone Democrats. They're the problem, wait a second, no, wait a second. Well, you know, before them we had a Republican, and there's the Republicans in the Senate. Now, it's the Republicans, no. <laughs> it's nice to blame them. But it's not them. Oh, maybe it's just karma. <laughs> Bad juju. No, it's me. I am the weakest link. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 said, this is what the Lord says. That means you probably ought to listen to it since it's what he says. A curse is placed on those who trust other people, who depend on humans for strength, who have stopped trusting the Lord. <gasps> it's one of those be quiet Dean and listen it's a very simple equation folks more trust in yourself equals less trust in God more trust in God equals less trust in yourself Jesus is telling the disciples hey it's going to get rough you're going to be scattered it's going to be tough watch and pray Hear God, don't trust yourself. Peter don't get it though, does he? Peter says, all these other clowns will bail you. I won't bail. He said, Peter, 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 hush. This very night, you're going to deny you even know me. Three times. I love the story of a young Christian girl. She was attending a secular college. And she's sitting through a class by a professor who's, you know, he was an atheist. And after he gave his big lecture on why there is no God, he opened the floor and asked if anybody there could debate him on the issue. No one stood up. They didn't want to go against a professor who would be grading their papers and their assignments and honestly had, you know, some leverage whether or not they passed or failed. They didn't want to do anything. So he said, oh, so no one wishes to stand. Is there no Christians here? And there was a freshman girl in the back of the room. And she stood up. And she began singing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. You know it. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. 
From victory unto victory, what his army shall he lead? Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. And slowly, but surely another one pops up, and another one, and another one. Finally, several other believers in that class stood up. And they got to that last verse that stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching into prayer where duty calls or danger. Be never wanting there. As the team comes, we'll wrap it up. If you read down through this chapter, you'll see where Judas does come. He betrays Jesus. You'll see Jesus' prediction came true as every one of the disciples is scattered. But the good thing is that is not the end of the story at all. When they relied on their own strength, they lost. But when they are empowered by the Holy Spirit after the resurrection, like we are as well, they win over and over and over again. These fearful men turned the world upside down. Folks, you and I, can do the very same thing when we do it for Jesus and with Jesus. But only if we do it the same way. You and I can win this evil version of Red Rover (laughs) as we watch and pray. We need to be people who are watching and praying. Where is the Spirit willing in you? Where is the flesh weak? You know where it is. But I hope now you know where the strength is to to defeat it. Turn that over to him. You know what he's talking about. Are you willing to take that stand for him today? Do you really know him today? We've been talking about that. I mean, obviously around it, but the truth, do you really know Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior? He can be. Very simple. We're talking about this whole season. It's going to be why Jesus did. We talked about it in communion. Why did he shed his blood? Why did, did he allow his body to be beaten like that? Because he knew the payment for sin was so important and we couldn't make it to heaven without it. And he said, I'll do it. Even in the garden when he prays, Lord, if there's, is there a plan B? If there is, let's go with plan B for Pete's sake. But if there's not, I'll still do it. We all have weak links. But we all have source. The source of the strength that we need to win. I love what it says in James chapter 4, verse 8. It says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. It doesn't have to be. I love this song. Are are we going to mean what we're singing? You are my all in all. I don't know what your need is. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in a lot of people's lives. We got, we got some serious sickness. We got some serious fear. Real fear. I'm not saying this isn't real. Maybe today's the day you want to come and say, you know what? I know this is all going on. It's crazy. But above it all, you're it. You're, you're my all. If he's not your all today, you can leave here with him being that. Maybe you need to be anointed. Maybe you need someone to pray with you. Maybe we'll make this your church home. I don't know what your need is. But I know what the answer is. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, when we know good and well. We look in the mirror. I know I'm not enough. I know I'm not enough. And I know I never will be. (laughs) But, Lord, I know you are. Because you are that all in all. Bless now this time of commitment in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me?
people said amen, amen. Uh, a couple quick things uh, don't forget the signs we've got a few out there take it put them in your yard preferably if you don't live at the end of a dead end street out in the middle of nowhere like they do in some folks in Carlisle <laughs> okay uh, but if you live on a street that's got some traffic put one of these out there let's people know what's going on uh, there, there's a few of them out there take them uh, we prefer you bring them back or keep them till next year we'll put them out again that's fine too uh, did want to mention the week after Easter, which is coming up, the 31st, I'm starting the, the next version, uh, same version, the 101 class. If you've been coming and questioning what kind of church this is, I, we're thinking about being a member. Doesn't make you a member to come to class. You don't have to come to class to be a member, but it uh, it gives you a chance that, why do we take communion every week? Why do we baptize by immersion? Uh, how come we don't have women preachers here? Uh, different questions like that. Get a chance to get to know me. I, I love that part of it. You get, you get to talk back and forth. That's a great thing. That'll start four or five weeks. It starts the week after Easter. I want to mention that. Uh, talk to Pam Ritchie this week. Uh, she's had the chemo. They're still waiting for some things. Uh, she wants your prayers. Don't stop by and visit right now. Her immune system's cooked pretty good right now. And so she didn't even want us to bring communion today, but I told her I'd mention that. Uh, it is good to see Rick Hash back. He's here feeling better. Still, still got room for improvement, but... Uh, and his health too uh, <laughs> but uh, and a uh, uh, little update too on Bud Barber uh, keep praying for Bud he, he's not he, they're allowing him to drive a little bit uh, he's hard headed like most men uh, but he's got a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on pray for Bud okay uh, also I mentioned my friend I'll mention it. his name's Don Don Carney pray for him and his family uh, and his friends he, he's, he's a dear man uh, but if you got a question about anything, what we talked about today, want to talk to one of us, man. Hey, Dan, Dan come here. Come here. <laughs> uh, Dan ain't saying anything about this. I'm not going to give all your details, but just, Dan just got a lot on him right now. So obviously, his wife's been, you know, battling the cancer, and I know there's mom issues. Just say it like that. <laughs> and it's just a, a lot. I just want to close out in prayer. I'm going to pray for Dan. Is that all right? Yeah. We love this guy. Father, we love you, and thank you that you love us. And thank you for this service, for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what we face, you are our all in all. Sometimes, Lord, we feel overwhelmed. We have people we love, people we care about, that we see them going through some really, really tough things sometimes. And sometimes we struggle, you know, ask questions. Why in the world is this happening? And that may never get an answer to that. Drive us to our knees. Drive us to your throne. Help us to see your grace and know that no matter what, you've never stopped loving us. You've never uh, given up on us. And you are our all in all. Bless Dan, his family, his mom, his wife. And Lord, I thank you for him and for each other in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.